What makes Castlevania for you? Are you there for the action, the exploration, the music, the vibes, the aesthetic, or maybe you just want to kick Dracula's ass every now and again? I think the answer is that all of this stuff is what makes up Castlevania's identity. But depending on the era of the Vania in question, the priorities shift and morph around to different ideas and ideals. Stage by stage progression, a sprawling map to explore, 3D spaces to scramble around in, gothic set dressing at all times. This kind of makes Castlevania a hard series to pin down though. Sure, they're all just action games if you really wanted to boil it down, but I don't play Symphony of the Night because of the action. I play it because I love the exploration, platforming, and the vibe. And I love The Men of Innocence for some of the same reasons, but in that case, I'm like 30% more interested in the combat side to that game. But there's no truly ideal Castlevania game for everyone in that sense. Most people would probably say that Symphony of the Night is the best, or maybe Order of Ecclesia, or maybe even Lords of Shadow. But while every Castlevania has its similarities, the differences make choosing favorites pretty hard, at least for me. But if there's anything to understand here, it's that Castlevania has never been afraid to evolve itself when necessary. And it's always been eager to try out some new stuff that may or may not have landed with you. It's hard not to respect that sort of fluidity though. A lot of series like this tend to run the risk of stagnating or struggling to come up with new ideas that satisfyingly move things forward. As long as Castlevania has solid action, gothic vibes, and a certain sense of scale, I think you're on to a winner nearly every time. And then we get to Lords of Shadow, which is a distinctly different kind of Castlevania game, mainly because... It's a reboot! Yay! That's right, Castlevania fell victim to the same fate that befell DMC the DMC, Thief, Tomb Raider, Ninja Gaiden, which isn't to lump them all in the same pile because they are not built equally, but they're all pretty drastic departures from the identities of their original counterparts. But Lords of Shadow isn't just a light reboot of the series. Tonally, it's something so much grittier self-serious and oftentimes strangely generic in comparison to the entire rest of the franchise. It's trying to emulate the experience of a dark fantasy movie with the basic conceit of a Castlevania, but in doing that it feels like it sort of loses its way along that path. That being said, I really don't hate what Mercury Steam did here with this game. I think it has some glaring issues here and there, but the soul of the experience is in the right place. and. I'm walking away with some stuff that I'll never quite forget, and I mean that positively. Lords of Shadow is a game that tries to take everything you know about Castlevania and twist it around ever so slightly. And the reason they did this is pretty simple. They wanted a new audience of Castlevania fans to come into the franchise. Without the baggage of a pretty long lineage of games, new players would readily flock to the new, new, shiny gothic action title. And the Gambit sort of did pay off with Lords of Shadow getting decent critical reception and having its fair share of fans, even today. Back when I was a teenager, and incidentally a fucking moron, I remember the official PlayStation magazine in the UK giving Lords of Shadow a glowing review. So all I knew about this game for years was that it was incredible. I, I can't find the magazine anywhere, but there's this old PlayStation blog post where where the deputy editor called it astonishingly good. So yeah, people did like it quite a bit. And then it happened. The reality sunk in that more than one opinion exists in this world. It sucks. Since that time, I've heard incredibly mixed things about Lords of Shadow, and after getting my feet wet with other 3D Castlevania adventures, I had to find out for myself whether Lords of Shadow was an interesting game in the series or not. And it is! It is certainly interesting and confusing, a bit weird, there's a lot of grunting, and I have a joke somewhere later about slinging meat, so look forward to that one. Now, Lords of Shadow is a reboot, but they haven't just tossed out every single thing that makes Castlevania a Castlevania. It's just that some details have been switched around a bit. Our hero for this game is Gabriel Belmont, a new Belmont that we've never seen before. So of course we're going to go and check out his character bio to see what his backstory is. And it's all the usual stuff you'd expect to see except for one little detail. Yet Gabriel is seemingly actually a Cronquist and chose the name Belmont for himself at some point. But there's only one character in the original Castlevania canon that had the surname Cronquist. A certain Matthias Cronquist, aka the man you may know in some canons as Vlad Tepes, aka Luke Evans from Dracula Untold, which is a better movie than people give it credit for. 
but I haven't watched it in 10 years, so, um, okay, hang on, wait. I'm actually gonna go and watch this movie and then come back. One minute. This will somehow come into play later on. Um, anyway, yeah, Gabriel is assumedly going to be Dracula, or be closely related to him in the future. Uh, stay tuned for the fifth part of this video to find out the answer to that. And I really like this little twist that may or may not happen, we'll find out later on, because what better way is there to reboot something and uproot the key convention of the series in the first place? I say that half-jokingly because I do like when reboots mess around like this and go a little wild, but uh, mileage varies on this sort of thing. It's all about execution and... Lords of Shadow is plenty of those. Now, unfortunately for Lords of Shadow, it uh, decided to be a reboot in a time that would be a... a pretty tumultuous time for action games. We're in a post-DMC4 Ninja Gaiden 2 list off other influential action games here from before 2010, world where the cream of the crop in the genre have firmly placed themselves in history. This is the turning point to which action games could either build off of that momentum or get a bit weird for a while. And yeah, things did get weird because Lords of Shadow resembles more of your typical 7th gen action adventure game than anything else in the Castlevania series. Think your Uncharted, your Tomb Raider 2013s, any other game from this time period that had climbing sections that looked like this. Yeah, I have to admit that this seems like a strange place to have taken Castlevania, if only because the first two 3D games are fairly unique in a lot of ways. Lament of Innocence is a pretty basic action game, sure, but its open structure and fun core staples make it a cool time. Then there's Curse of Darkness, which is simply incredible and very different to its predecessor. You've got the ID system, a non-Belmont protagonist voiced by Crispin Freeman, and a vampire killer soundtrack. Both games are unlike each other, and it's hard for me to think of other games that they're really similar to. Yeah, that, that PS2 action games where we didn't entirely figure things out yet, but that clearly gave us some interesting flavor combinations when we least expected it. Lords of Shadow comes across as a very generic sort of game in comparison because it's riffing off what every other game was doing for the few years before and after 2010. But the most obvious comparison to make here is actually, obviously, God of War. In almost every sense of the word, Castlevania Lords of Shadow is just a carbon copy of God of War. And yeah, I'm not surprised. I feel like if there was any template the Mercury Steam was going to follow, it'd be that one. And boy, does that kind of make the game feel weird to play now. God of War is not a bad template to borrow from, for the record. But what's not to love about combat, puzzle solving, and platforming on a, on a big and beautiful set? I mean it when I say that taking from God of War feels logical for a Castlevania game. The similarities and ideas are there if you look close enough. And Lords of Shadow does do some neat spins on the formula here and there. With mechanics that feel unique to it, vibes that are specific to these walls, and a certain gut feeling that just works. Lords of Shadow is the first Castlevania I've played where the iconography of the series is blurred between being a legendary franchise and something like Dante's Inferno, borrowing from the games around it to the degree of being written off as a clone of them instead of something inherently its own. That's kind of a symptom that action games haven't really recovered from, though. Take a look at the current landscape and how every promising action game is revealed to just be another Souls-like or Sekiro parry-laden copy. Once we hit a certain point in time, the action game space sort of funneled itself into being games that just copy what FromSoft was doing over a decade ago. Just like how we had plenty of games in the PS3 days copy from God of War or Uncharted. Games do copy each other in this space though, and that's not a bad thing. It happens all across media. Nothing is inherently unique and everything gets its ideas from somewhere. But it's about how an experience takes and morphs these ideas into something with its own identity. Which was a lot easier to do in the PS2 days when almost everything felt rough and novel. But what happens when we take God of War's formula and apply it to Castlevania? We first get a perceived sense of big budget AAA spectacle. This means you're going to get a wide range of environments, plenty of set PC moments, broken up by moody cutscenes and brutal gameplay. All with the flair of a big budget video game experience. Not that this game had a big budget necessarily. In fact, from what I can gather, this game had a fairly middling budget. Which means that the spectacle on display here is of a nickel and dime sort. 
that frankly makes it all the more endearing. The other benefit of taking God of War's framework is that the gameplay follows a pretty varied structure, in the sense that we've got combat rooms, puzzles to solve, and plenty of platforming to get into. But not all of these are built equally well. Puzzles are mostly a really nice and refreshing break from the regular flow of the game, but every now and then, you get one that just doesn't make any sense until you get a clue for it. I absolutely loved the electricity puzzle at Frankenstein's lab, where you need to open different gates to pass an electric current around to create openings around this maze. And the few times you need to bounce a light beam around a room were really fun too. But then you get puzzles that use other mechanics in interesting, but completely unclear ways. There's one that requires you to use the shoulder charge to move across these dials on the floor quickly, but up until now this ability was only used to break things down and not at all used for its speed. So it's weird that the game just assumes that you know how that works, especially because it uses up the dark magic meter and I really don't want to waste that bar and have to go back to a fountain stand there for half a minute recharging the thing. But in situations like this, Lords of Shadow really does try its best to keep things varied, with you constantly doing something that's different to the next and it is appreciated but still climbing feels jank there's wonky ledge grab detection and constant invisible walls blocking edges which makes platforming a headache most of the time then you get situations where it's almost impossible to know where to go on a wall because the camera mixed with the subtle design on the ledges makes it hard to see where to go it's situations like this where the yellow paint really would be handy to have I am really thankful for the variety that's here though because if there's one thing the PS2 Castlevanias weren't, it was that. Those games were 80% combat rooms, 10% boss fights, and another 10% of me staring at the PS2 laden beauty of it all. I love this console so much. We've got big vistas, spooky gothic castles, quiet moments counted by gigantic set pieces, or inspiring scale, dirty little caves. There's a lot of stuff here that you wouldn't necessarily expect from something with a smaller budget, especially given how this is a complete completely linear game and none of these areas really get reused at any point if you don't do any backtracking to previous levels. The big open environments of the PS2 games were clever in that they were so simple in construction and detail. The dev team was able to do a lot with very little and since you would come back through these areas they'd get a lot of mileage. In Lords of Shadow's case this incredible shot of this castle is used this one time. And never again. And frankly that's got big Gabriel meat swinging energy. There it is! That's the joke. Slinging the meat. That's... Yeah, that's it. Sorry. The game throws these amazing shots at you and then throws you into a corridor until you're ready to be wowed again. And I assumed for a while that this was a big budget game because of that. I was ready to be blown away by certain scenes every time I turned a corner, and then had the amazing revelation that this wasn't a big budget, it was just incredible art design carrying a lot of these vistas. Other things help that big budget feeling though, like the big orchestral soundtrack that sounds absolutely nothing like Castlevania whatsoever. I'd go so far as to call it a little generic from a series that has had such a creative sound through the years. But after a while the soundtrack grew on me to the point that I would just stop and listen to the epic sounding score every so often, especially with how it had paired with these, these gorgeous backgrounds. It's so beautiful. Oh, and I can't forget to mention the fact that Patrick Stewart is in this game. Now, Patrick Stewart is no stranger to voicing his fair share of video game roles. He was in Oblivion for about 30 seconds and probably sold about half a million of those copies just with his presence. And he's played his characters in X-Men and Star Trek licensed games. But Castlevania is an entirely new and unique thing for him to be in. And he by far has the most dialogue out of any of the characters in the game, including Gabriel. And let me tell you, the ratio is not in Gabe favor. Patrick Stewart plays Zobak, a kind of mentor-ish figure to Gabriel, and he narrates every single mission's loading screen with a decently sized paragraph in each one. This night he rides looking for the old gods, armed with an amulet that has led him here. Tonight he will begin his journey into oblivion. There are 50 missions, so he narrates 50 intro screens and plays an entire character on top of that. So now I have to wonder, how much of this game's budget went into getting poop from the Emoji Movie into this game? It's a great choice, don't get me wrong, Stuart is putting his heart and soul into this role 
and clearly having a good time. But whenever you get a big actor like this in your game, it begs the question of why they're really here, as opposed to a cheaper and more well-established voice actor. Because if this game really did have a mid-sized budget, I have to wonder what that extra money could have gone to. Not that I know the ins and outs of budgetary politics and video game development. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, really. Hold on a minute, Jason Isaacs plays Satan in this game too? What the hell are all these Hollywood stars doing in my Castlevania? So, Lords of Shadow presents itself as this big scale adventure with a sweeping score, Hollywood talent and stunning visuals, but there's stuff here that Mercury Steam clearly saved some time and money on. Unfortunately, in the combat department, enemy design is pretty simplistic throughout, areas only have a handful of gimmicks to pull from, and the little touches of the experience just feel a bit out of place. Like these twinkly little sound effects that play on some menus. Ignorant like sheep to the slaughter. This How dare you. This is supposed to be a grim dark tale of gothic woe. Why is Tinkerbell making sounds on my screen? Then there's the weird contrast between Gabriel's melancholic performance by Robert Carlyle, which is really good in some scenes, and the weirdly aggro battle grunts he has that don't really match up the, with the vibe of Gabriel's speaking voice at all. And what was left of my broken humanity felt obliged to do the honourable thing. <laughs> There's also plenty of bugs, some wonky combat stuff, and generally a lack of elements that keep this nearly 20 hour experience entirely engaging the whole way through. 7th gen spectacle is joined by familiar Castlevania traits like new abilities, beefing up your moveset, cool sub weapons that give you a helping hand in combat, and backtracking through beaten levels to get some stat upgrades. So while we have all of this stuff that Castlevania has never really had before, some of the classic trademark stuff is intact. It's also worth highlighting some of the quirkiest stuff here too. I really like the big book framing here, like the journey we're about to go on has already been recorded in history, which sort of fits in with the presentation of the other games too. But here I think there's a lot of fun to be had, with the page turning to each different menu, little flipbook animations to display new combat moves, and the way the action gets freeze framed when you pause the game, it all looks very nice. Mercury Steam was very clever to use the spectacle and framework of a God of War game while still keeping some of the aesthetic tentpoles of Castlevania more or less intact. It makes Lords of Shadow feel like a new experience that harkens back to its predecessors in some interesting ways. But because of that, I think it ends up highlighting its flaws so much more too. As an experience, Lords of Shadow is uneven, overly long, and sometimes very frustrating narratively and in its gameplay, even though the spectacle truly is impressive sometimes. So does this combo work all that well? Does the glitz and the glamour mesh well with the glitches and the manner of play here? It's hard to say, because it's really a yes and no sort of situation. I'm not sure anyone was really desperate for Castlevania to get this sort of treatment. I think the series would have likely pr prospered from getting Symphony of the Night 2 over an attempt to turn the series into a big Hollywood blockbuster type thing. But it's neat to see what Castlevania looks like from this sort of perspective. Again, I like when reboots go a little weird with it, and yeah, this is certainly weird at times. But now we have to look at Lords of Shadow from a different point of view. For a lot of people, this game was their introduction to Castlevania as a series. And I'm sure that led them down to going back and checking out the rest of the games at some point too. So in that sense, no matter how Lords of Shadow turned out, this game did what it needed to do for a lot of people out there. And I think that's genuinely commendable. I don't want this video to turn into some kind of cynical overview of this game because that's not fair to the dev team or the people that really love it. So let me take this moment to thank Mercury Steam for their contribution to this franchise because it is obvious that this team really did care about making a really cool Castlevania game. Now, with that out the way, let's talk about dead wives. This is just gonna be a short aside, but, but seriously, what is it with wives dying in video games? I understand that the dead loved one is a narrative device that is used everywhere in our world, mostly as a way to give heroes new motivations in comics. But I feel like dead wives in particular are something that games love to whip out when they need to give our heroes some kind of motivation. 
Max Payne, James Sunderland, Kratos, hell, we've got our own examples in Castlevania with Leon and Sarah and Hector and Dracula. There are so many other examples of this too but that I won't get into in case I potentially spoil some games for everyone, but this trope is very common. And I'm not even sure this is news to most of us. I don't really have any deep analysis for why this is or shouldn't exist beyond thinking that it's just kind of a weird trope. It's just funny that killing the wife is the break glass in case of emergency method for giving our main character motivation. And yes, I did just bonk the mic because I'm passionate about this subject, I think, I guess. Yeah. Uh, obviously, some stories handle this aspect better than others, but you, you kind of need to, to work really hard to make me care about it. Because I don't care about most of these random couples, why should I? <laughs> you can't just start a story with a wife already dead and expect that to make your story tug at the heartstrings. Only Silent Hill 2 gets that privilege. And Max Payne 1, but that's a little different because the game literally begins with your wife and baby dying. Yeah, that's... that's... that's guttural. <clears throat> yeah, that hits... that does hit different. Mm. Mm. Look, I, I get why this, this whole thing exists, since a lot of the creators behind these stories would probably be very upset if their wife died in similar circumstances. So from a tragic point of view, I can get why it's a common point. It's kind of like how every game was about a dad for a little while until that stopped getting as much attention. See, what really needs to happen now, though, is the resurgence of emo twink action games. Now, this is a genre I can get behind. Or in front of. I mean, hey, both works for me. Sugar McGregor. Alright, so combat in Lords of Shadow is the definition of a mixed bag. It's got some good ideas, some bad ones, some that are okay, others that are annoying but ultimately underwhelming. The bones of what's here is good, and it's a framework that has some decent potential that it doesn't quite grow beyond. Gabriel's weapon is the Combat Cross, which is the rebootified version of the Vampire Killer. It's a pretty sick weapon shaped in the form of a crucifix that unleashes a chain at the top and functions just like the whip you know and love. Gabriel has direct attacks that go out straight ahead of him, and area attacks that are used to strike at enemies around him. Hey, it's just like Lament of Innocence, which is nice. I do think that this sort of system is the best way to go about using the whip in a 3D space, as opposed to going with the light and heavy attack route. The whole point of the whip is it having good range and using that to keep enemies at a distance, so I'm glad that identity has remained. And that range is a key part of the combat since Gabriel can strike enemies from pretty far far away. Meaning that if you have an enemy you're struggling to fight, you can try to keep your distance and work on it from afar. Now this introduces another problem in that enemies are designed to mess you up with this playstyle in mind. Some enemies do a dash attack or launch a projectile in these situations, or they'll be these skeleton assholes that have insanely weird hitboxes where they swing their sword and hit you from a mile away. That's cheating. That's, that's unfair. Gabriel also has aerial combos to use and they feel pretty good. It's also really easy to get enemies up into the air by pressing the jump button at any point during a combo. Gabriel shoots up into the air and can take an enemy with him if he's close enough. You also get access to a pull ability that can bring an enemy up to you in midair, which is pretty good when it works. A lot of these sort of moves are unreliable since it largely depends on whether an enemy is doing a big animation that's interruptible or not. If that's the case, you'll just yank on them and get nothing in return. There's also some really fun attacks with the whip, like this slamming down combo you can repeat up to nine times that strikes enemies at range, or this six spinning whip attack that can deal a ton of sustained damage. There's some really neat stuff here when you put it all together, which makes an initially interesting combat system. But what the hell is up with those QTEs? There's button mashing QTEs, which is the usual thing, you know how these work. But then there's these other ones that have you pushing any button you want as soon as the outer circle enters the smaller one. And it's just a weirdly boring QTE to have. Like, you could have found some way to make this a little more engaging. Hell, I would have preferred a much tighter timed button push sequence like God of War does. QTEs in general are a funny concept because of how much backlash they used to get. But you can get some that have a sort of interesting methodology behind them. QTEs are also just kind of funny. Especially if they give you some nice comedic fail animations. Unbearable pain! Or open up slightly into different attack animations that you may, not, may or may not always see. Conceptually, there's nothing wrong with a QTE that wears its heart on its sleeve. And Lords of Shadow might have benefited from being a little more inventive with it. They mostly feel like begrudging additions that are there because that's just what you do in an action game like this. In, in the same vein, grabs are kind of weak in general because they aren't gory or visceral enough. They take too long to do as well. 
I know that makes me sound like a, a violence junkie, <laughs> but I but I review action games. What the hell do you think this was when you showed up here? When, when I grab an enemy for some kind of finisher, I, I want it to be a spectacle in itself. Why the hell does Gabriel just stand there holding a guy for half a minute and then proceed to stab him with the crucifix? Like, what's, what's going on there? And unfortunately, striking enemies with the whip feels pretty weak and lacks that sort of cracking sensation I think needs to exist. The camera does a good job of accentuating some of the impact, but I think maybe some work on the sound design would have made the whip just just hit that little bit harder. It's weird because Lament of Innocence got this feeling down pretty well, so it's a shame they couldn't get quite the same feeling here. A whip in an action game has a lot going for it, but if that kinetic presentation isn't quite there, then it doesn't really feel that great to use. I think Lords of Shadow also struggles to keep the basics of combat engaging after the initial 20 hour playthrough, because you easily fall into the rhythm of doing the same combos again and again. There's a lack of variety in the combat that makes it really hard to engage with on a deeper level, and Gabriel's moveset doesn't get massively expanded save for a few combo enders, and that's really it. Which is really where the biggest difference between it and God of War lies. God of War has a ton of combos to unlock in each game, and a few different weapons to use as well just to spice things up before they get stale. And that's really important when your game is as long as Lords of Shadow is. God of War also doesn't get enough respect as an action game because those games really do have some great ideas, mainly when it comes to making the attacks feel weighty and implementing QTEs in a smart way. Like if we're really going to be competitive comparing them, Lords of Shadow really does come across like a cheaper version of God of War. And yes, I am tired of comparing them, but if I don't do it, I just know someone down in the comments will, so I'm nipping that in the bud right now. Frankly, Lords of Shadow doesn't really compare to the other 3D Vania games for me either when it comes to combat. Again, Lament of Innocence is about a 12 hour game, give or take, and the basic aspects of that combat system don't matter as much as they do here because they don't have to sustain a much longer game. Leon's basic attacks also feel snappy and when the basics feel as good as that I don't typically need much else. I do wonder if giving the combat cross an additional weapon mode would have helped. I really hate suggesting stuff like this because I'm not I'm not a game dev and I understand how stupid it is to say just add this thing duh just add this weapon just do that that's so easy right no no it isn't. But in a completely hypothetical world, it would have been cool if Gabriel's stake attachment on the cross actually functioned as its own weapon. Maybe unlocking an up and close personal melee moveset that, that had more risk attached but opened up some more combo opportunities. In my mind, that would have been sick. But again, it's not that easy. Slapping in more weapons into an already underwhelming gameplay loop is risky though, usually because it just makes it more obvious how unsatisfying that loop is. If you don't want to use anything other than the weapon that works, then you're denying half of the options the game gives you, making most of the combat options redundant. And that's never a good feeling for an action game to have. There's a difference between finding the weapon that works for you and the one that does the job because it kills things quickly and with less hassle. If we take a minute and think about why Curse of Dark works so well in this department, it's because of the sheer weapon variety you have to make use of in that game, with every weapon also feeling good to use. And the way you're incentivized to keep creating new weapons and try out different weapon types naturally keeps things from getting stale. But Lords of Shadow is naturally a very different game in that regard. I don't think it needed to have that amount of variety, but something to shake things up would have been nice. What doesn't help things is that the general enemy design doesn't really require much from you to take them down. You can basically do the usual attacks you would do against any other enemy and deal with them just fine. I'm not asking for red attacks kill red enemies and vice versa for blue though, but I wish enemies had more stuff you could like yank off of them with the whip or something. They do this with some enemies like the big armored guys that have those shields you can rip off or the ghosts that you can pull into the end to deal more damage to. And that's great. Hell, I'd love to just full on throw enemies with the whip. The the idea is almost there with the air yank, but I don't know man, 
let me yank everywhere, you know? But yeah, ultimately, I think Lords of Shadow suffers from variety and a lack of oomph being its two biggest detractors. But there are still some pretty good ideas here. I really like the magic system being split up into light and dark magic that have completely different properties. Light magic refills Gabriel's health every time you land a hit with that mode on, and dark magic lets you deal double damage. Both have magical combos with the dark magic grand pan move being my favorite since it just rinses enemies. But the light magic combo where Gabriel sucks enemies in and unleashes this maelstrom of attacks at them is awesome too. Gabriel also gets a big fisting gauntlet for big punch attacks, which are fun to do grand pans with, but I didn't find much of a use for that in most fights. Then there's the sprint boots, which have two issues. The sprint doesn't work continuously, it only works for a few seconds, then you have to activate it again, and you do that by pressing the analog stick in the same direction twice, and this gets really annoying fast. Anything that involves you pressing the stick twice feels bad. There's nothing in the world that feels good with that input in a 3D game, and I understand that it's supposed to harken back to how running in some veneers works with you pushing the direction twice, but I don't need to explain how much better that feels in a 2D plane than a 3D one. Also, sprint just isn't fast enough. It's not really what it needs to be, and also doesn't make complete sense with Gabriel's moveset being what it is. Again, the combat cross is a weapon that gives you a huge range advantage, meaning you don't really need to close in on enemies ever. So the sprint isn't really a useful tool for closing in on enemies, and there's no real need to use it to evade anything. So its use as a tool is really weird in combat. Though it's mostly just a platforming tool anyway, I guess it's just weird that it doesn't have much combat utility too. It does look cool though, I love Gabriel's little little hops. It's very, it's fun. It's cute. I like it. It's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Visually, combat does have this really awesome flair in moments like this, where the effects go wild, Gabriel is bounding with energy, and then unleashing all of that in those dire moments of combat. Oh, it feels great. Refilling the magic is interesting too. You have to collect these light orbs and hold L3 to refill the light meter, and R3 to refill the dark meter. You have to make the decision in combat right then and there about which meter is more important to you. And that's a really great way to build in some light resource management. You get a few orbs when you defeat enemies, but the real way to earn them is by filling up the focus meter at the bottom of the screen. To do that, you just need to attack enemies and avoid being hit yourself. Doing a flawless block also massively fills the meter, so you can essentially just do that and spam attack to quickly farm orbs in a fight. Now this system is a smart way to keep things interesting and keep the action from getting too uh, passively boring, because there's an inherent reward for mastering certain enemy types and getting magic refills to do more damage. It creates a satisfying loop that kept me wanting to improve at least a little bit. But now I'm starting to realize that I'm doing all this just for fights to be over quicker. So am I really enjoying the combat or just wanting it to end sooner so I can move on to the next thing? I guess my main point here is that I think it feels wrong for the player to be able to pop a damage boosting supplement whenever they feel like it at minimal cost. Mainly because it makes the combat feel more like an optimization hell zone of everything feeling too slow without that damage boost. Maybe if there was more of a cost attached to it, like having it drain Gabriel's health while in use, maybe then I'd be more engaged with it as a mechanic. But as it is, I think it highlights some misguided aspects of the combat system. What I'm really finding out here is that Lords of Shadow is as much as a God of War clone as it is an evolution of Lament of Innocence. And that's really cool! Both games share a lot of ideas, and I think Lament ultimately feels better to me, but I respect the steps that Lords of Shadow takes to evolve and bring some new ideas to Castlevania's table. Platforming, on the other hand, didn't need new ideas. It just needed to work properly. Out of combat, puzzling, and platforming, I think the last one is the weakest pillar of the three. It's wobbling with a gentle breeze and ready to get knocked over at any minute, and I'm coming in with a fucking bat. For a start, Gabriel's movement is kind of jerky, which is fine in any situation that isn't platforming because it makes positioning a nightmare, especially because you need a running start on some jumps to clear a gap. This isn't like Ninja Gaiden where Ryu gets that momentum for a forward jump very quickly. This makes going for certain jumps really annoying, especially if you're aiming for a ledge and didn't jump at the right angle because the camera got weird. There isn't any sort of ledge magnetism 
in this game like a lot of other games from this time period sort of had and you may expect the double jump to help with this because yes this game does have a double jump but well done mercury steam you have managed to create one of the worst double jumps my poor eyes i've ever had to see the double jump makes gabriel jerk upwards sometimes causing him to rush right over the ledge you need and fly further away than you were before and it also commits a cardinal sin because you cannot use the double jump to redirect Gabriel at all. Let's say you jumped off a ledge incorrectly and wanted to go back and save some health. Nope, you're just gonna have to fail it and try again. Even clambering around feels kinda janky in a way I struggle to describe. But if we're being honest, the platforming is nothing disastrous, and I know I'm being just a, a big baby about it. But considering that platforming is a big part of Castlevania's identity, and that it wasn't really explored in the other 3D games, I was actually really excited to see how it was going to be done here. And, eh, it's easily the roughest part of the experience. The only times Lords of Shadow truly feels like a janky game is in these moments. And the game itself clearly doesn't really like it either. Here's that glitch again of me falling through the world. It's, it's very fun. Bottom line, the idea is that the game has aren't really original, but they work well for the most part. And most of the criticisms I have come down to the systems not really feeling super polished or engaging as the game goes on. But some fights are still really fun. And I absolutely love the sections where we're climbing all over the scenery and getting to see the world from these beautiful vantage points. There are just a few problems that could have been ironed out in the game feel department that could have gone a long way to making the journey feel snappier. Time to step it up. Lords of Shadow takes place in 1047, which is an interesting year because of how relatively close it is to Lament of Innocence in 1094. But since this is a reboot, you can take almost all of your prior knowledge of the games out of your mind. Almost. My name is Renaldo Gandalf. The overall vibe is a lot more grim than you might expect though. It's the end of days since the Earth's connection to heaven and God has been weakened by the Lords of Shadow and the souls of the dead are trapped on Earth as they cannot ascend to heaven. So it's up to Gabriel Belmont to sort it out and crack the whip. Now in this world, there's a group called the Brotherhood of Light whose entire job is to safeguard the people from the demons that are coming to kill them. Every other member of this faction is dead and used to hold puzzle clues and story tidbits. So yeah, but not a very well-functioning group. Which is funny because we only see a handful of these guys from this group. And only a fraction of them are good guys. As far as Gabriel's concerned, he's on a big revenge quest to kill the demons and the Lords of Shadow because his wife Marie died from a demon attack. I refer to my previous section about dead wives. And now Gabriel is sad, mad, and will never be a dad. So he's going off to get some sweet goth boy revenge. But there is light at the end of the tunnel when Zobek, aka Patrick Stewart, says that by killing the Lords of Shadow and claiming their power, Gabriel can get his dead wife back. Which definitely seems like the thing that is going to happen here. The journey is a long one, with 50 missions in total spread across 12 chapters, and the pacing of it all starts to wear thin after a while, I cannot lie. I do not think it's a good idea that the game constantly tells you how much is left until the end of the game, because it just makes it all the more apparent when certain levels are clearly just there for filler, and the ratio between gameplay and storytelling leans heavily toward the former. The setup is simple, the motivation is clear, but I think the way the game goes about doing all this is a little bit boring. Gabriel's key motivation is bringing Marie back, but it's not a journey that feels as interesting as what Leon had to go through in Lament of Innocence. Half of Leon's journey was about saving Sarah, and when things went wrong and she died, he then went on his vengeance quest. You feel that shock in the moment with Leon and acknowledge his failure, and that translates to the last few parts of the game having a really solid revengeance vibe. But I am beloved by the night. You will taste my powers. I'll kill you and the night! In Lords of Shadow, we're sort of rehashing this plot point again, but instead of the peaks and valleys of Lament's plot, we're already thrust into the revenge arc for two characters we don't even know. Granted, at least this game actually has Marie speak. Hector's wife did not get the same respect. 
I can think of maybe three scenes where Gabriel is shown to be vulnerable for a second and truly missing the love of his life. And it's, it's hard to really care when I don't know if Gabriel cares all that much. Obviously, they're taking Gabriel down this solemn, dark route where he doesn't show off his personality much because he's keeping it balled up inside. And that's brilliant because a video game is the perfect medium for peeling that back just a little bit and giving us some of his inner monologue to clue us in about what he's going through. The game clearly wants to hone in on the tragic and heartbreaking aspects of Gabriel, but it just doesn't let us peek at what's inside. I'm going on about this so much because tragic romance is a key part of gothic storytelling and a huge aspect to Castlevania as well. Tragic love is what kickstarted the centuries-long battles between the Belmonts and Dracula. And when you can get it right, this sort of narrative can really hit hard. But Lords of Shadow seems really disinterested in digging into these feelings in a satisfying way, which is really frustrating and kind of feeds back into the lament of 7th gen where action game heroes couldn't show their feelings for some reason. Then as soon as God of War 2018 did it, everyone realized that yes, having badass dudes cry was fucking awesome. Notionally, Lords of Shadow tries to get these feelings across in subtle ways. Gabriel's character design is one I actually really like because it's a lot harsher than others in the series. The skull motifs, red, gold and black color scheme mixed in with some sharper angles and as you defeat Lords of Shadow Gabriel gets a big demonic gauntlet and some awesome boots to go along with it all. It's a simple design and one that strays away from the elegance and ever appropriate wear of Castlevania's other protagonists. And that's mainly because Gabriel's one job in this game is to kill while every other Belmont kills and prays, I guess. I guess that's the main difference. Yeah, let's go with that. But it's the little moments outside of the action that speak to the emotional impacts of the journey. Those brief sections where you're able to take in the scenery, even if it's just for a few minutes. There's really some breathtaking stuff here, but my favorite spot is here on this cliff overlooking the ocean, seeing the ruins out at sea. There's something so comforting about the lighting here, the blocking and Gabriel's place in it all. The camera often zooms out to show how small Gabriel is in this massive world, and that sense of scale sometimes crushing down upon him is a nice way of visualizing his grief, his longing, and how nothing can really bring him peace. Scale is what the camera's best at showing off, but I also wish it pulled itself in a little more too. We get that every now and then, like with the entrance of this ice cave, but examples like this are few and far between. Which is a shame, because fixed camera angles can do a lot more to tell a story and make certain areas pop. And Lord of Shadow understands that perfectly with these big sweeping vistas, but balancing that with tighter moments would have worked well too. Either way though, I just love staring at the environment. Moments like this are honestly some of my favorite in any game that does them. FromSoft uses scenery like this a lot to depict moods before you go into an area. In Dark Souls 2's case, Majula is constantly this beautiful scene where the soft glow of the sunset warms you up for the journey ahead. But there's always that sense that the darkness is just around the corner too. It's a sign of peace, warmth, a gentle caress before you step into the horror that is Dark Souls 2. I think my fascination with this sort of thing actually came from playing Twilight Princess as a kid. I would spend hours upon hours just looking at these environments and trying to soak up as much of the mood as I could. I literally have an entire video talking about all this stuff already, so, so go watch that if you want to hear more of my, my thoughts on Twilight Princess. It's truly a beautiful game. Little moments where things can just breathe for a second are so special because of how much information and emotion they communicate. I think I just love feeling like a genuine part of the world. And yeah, I think Lords of Shadow nails this feeling. I really want to reinforce how the game nails the lighting in other areas too. Getting across the icy winds of the vampire lair and contrasting that with the sunlight breaching the halls of their stronghold. Or the lush colors of this forest, the life and vibrancy on display here is astounding. Lords of Shadow has to be up there for one of the prettiest PS3 games I've ever played because look at this stuff, it's just so nice to look at. It's frankly amazing how colorful this game is in the era it came out in. Not to say that every 7th gen game was about the greys and the beiges, and usually the ones that were had an aesthetic reason to be that way, but it was easy to assume that a Castlevania managed by another developer could have taken the visuals down a supremely dark and edgy route. 
appropriate for another gothic game maybe, like The Darkness, where opting to crush the colours and present the world in a more monochromatic way can give the world a certain grit. I don't think this would have served Lords of Shadow well at all though. With how colourful the game is now, each area is able to sell various moods so intuitively. I also really like Gabriel's mannerisms, like his idle pose in combat. He stands, ready to attack at any moment, but looks away from his enemies as if there's something about this impending violence he doesn't fully commit himself to. Maybe because he's aware that there's something dark inside him that he doesn't want to confront just yet. Not until the journey is over and he can finally be with his wife again. Lords of Shadow bases a lot of its ideas around the themes of grief and conflict, but I would say it mainly covers the idea of faith and how blind faith can lead you down the wrong path. I could also say it covers the idea of destiny and prophecy and how some things can't be changed no matter what on the paths we walk. Just take a look at this game's story, it's already written in this book and we're reading it one chapter at a time. We can take a look at the Lords of Shadows themselves and how Cornell and Carmilla are actually revealed to be the dark halves of the Brotherhood of Light's founders that were cast off of them when they ascended to heaven. As their original forms, their faith in God had them fighting off Satan's minions and when it came time to ascend as spirits, they didn't consider what or who they were leaving behind. Twisted, dark forms of themselves that only know to be cruel. And isn't that sort of a tragedy in itself? Then there's Gabriel who clings to this hope that the journey to defeat the Lords of Shadow can bring his wife back from the dead. Which is clearly a lost cause, but what other choice does he have other than to believe in Zobek and the supposed prophecy that Gabriel could fulfill? Faith isn't only represented as something fallible though. Marie's faith in Gabriel never falters throughout the journey and she's by his side during moments when things do get too much for him. Then there's characters like Claudia and Laura who show that even in the darkest parts of the world there is still some humanity in places that you may not expect it to be. Claudia is actually one of the cooler characters in the game because she brings some much needed life to Lords of Shadow's early hours. She also speaks telepathically because she's the last of a cool civilization that had access to magical powers. She also has a bodyguard who's a large guy and I respect him for it. When you break those ideas down, there's a lot of interesting stuff to chew on from a gothic storytelling perspective. And what helps carry all this across is the music. You get these tracks that heighten the mood of so many scenes in this game. Songs that truly emphasize scale and the melancholy of the time. All the while carrying this deliciously tragic undertone throughout it all. It's unlike anything that Castlevania has really done before in its music, which I started off not liking so much, because again, the music sort of feeds into the seventh gen desire of wanting video games to emulate movies more and more, and a score like this really hammers in that nail. But I appreciate what this soundtrack does for Lords of Shadow, because it emphasizes the moments that matter. It heightens these views, carries the feelings and moods of Gabriel, while maintaining that gothic vibe that I think is so important. I mean, just look at this opening battle and how the music kicks in when the warg embraces the power of the moon. That's fucking cinema right there. The problem though circles back to the fact that the game struggles with truly embracing these aspects in the presentation of the storyline. And that ends up really loosening the screws on this ship because so little time is spent with Gabriel characterizing his thoughts and feelings and remaining pretty quiet for most of the experience. I just struggle to fully buy into this journey, which ends up dragging down a lot of these other elements, unfortunately. There's truly some astonishingly beautiful stuff in this game. It's just tragic that it doesn't really fully buy into the experience that it wants to be. But ultimately, a tragedy is exactly what this game is. Throughout the game, Gabriel feels himself slipping more and more into darkness, which is something that Zobek also describes in his journal since he's secretly following Gabriel throughout the story. And the first time we really see that something is wrong is when Gabriel has a nightmare that he has killed Claudia, our cool friend with a big magical ogonite who could easily mess us up. Oh, never mind, that fight was actually really easy. Anyway, um, he then wakes up to find that his nightmare is at least partially true and that Claudia is dead. 
This then brings into question the validity of Gabriel's memories and actions. Did he knowingly kill Claudia? Was he tricked in some way? Did he even do it to begin with? What really happened to his wife? Of course, Gabriel never actually takes any time to question this stuff because he barely says anything that doesn't contribute to the next fight or stage in the game. So it's pretty easy to forget that all this intrigue is there until the end of the story. Fast forward, give or take 15 hours though, and Gabriel has defeated all three Lords of Shadow, conquered their home bases, and is now ready to bring Marie back. Except the biggest twist known to man takes place right before his eyes, where Zobek is revealed to be none other than Patrick Stewart. No, he's actually the final Lord of Shadow, and the one that's manipulating Gabriel all this time. He's the one that brainwashed Gabriel to kill Claudia as he slept, and also forced Gabriel to unknowingly kill his wife, Marie. He is the cause of, of Gabriel's heartbreak, his sadness, his anger and frustration. And now he's going to be the final boss, right? Well, how about I told you that instead of fighting Zobek, um, Satan actually appears and kills Zobek for us. What ensues then is a final battle between God's strongest soldier, enthused by the souls of Marie and everyone else lingering in this world, and Satan, the angel cast out of heaven and planning to take power by any means necessary. I have to say, this is a little bit of a surprise because I didn't really think we'd straight up be fighting Satan in this game, but yeah, here we are. Gabriel wins, Satan is defeated and sent back down to the deep below, and Gabriel is finally reunited with Marie. But the truth is that Gabriel must live on while Marie and all the other souls finally transcend to heaven, leaving Gabriel well and truly alone after the journey is all said and done. I mentioned that the theme of faith earlier was a prevailing thought in the game, but the other side of that coin is betrayal. Gabriel's faith in the journey is ultimately betrayed by Zobek and Satan, but also the reality of life and death. He wants nothing more than to be with Marie in the afterlife, but he's been, cruelly in his eyes, granted life instead. And one of the most poignant moments in this ending is when Gabriel sees Claudia's soul ascend to causing him to collapse to his knees in anguish for all that he's done. It's a fascinating note to end on because this is not a happy ending in any way. Even if Gabriel saved the world and all of the lingering souls, he didn't get the one thing he wanted. All of the obvious signs point towards Gabriel being the hero of the story because he is effectively. We're killing demons, there's this uplifting, moody soundtrack, beautiful scenery amid the dark, and we're conquering the darkness too. It, you know, it's a hero's journey, right? But this is a war hero's tale at its core. There's no happy ending or feeling of satisfaction waiting for Gabriel at the end of this story. And it's interesting then how Lords of Shadow balances the natures of faith with the idea that sometimes things just will not end the way you want them to, no matter how sorry you are or what you do to seek forgiveness, which is a horrifically dark thing to explore. And I don't think Lords of Shadow does a good enough job delving into it, even though it does raise some interesting questions. We then have to look onwards to the post credit scene of the game, which is both the coolest thing in Lords of Shadow and also the most fucking insane rug pull I've ever seen in my life. We see this big, spooky, gothic church that is shown to us as this cloaked figure walks through the halls and delves into its back rooms. He then magically floats up to a hidden section of the tower. Oh, it's Zobek, by the way. It's uh, Zobek. Zobek's still alive, but who gives a fuck? Ah, is he full Patrick Stewart? Ah, he's, he's, he's alive. He's alive. Where he talks to the Lord of Darkness, which is obviously Dracula, which is cool. I thought it was weird that we didn't see Dracula in this game. Like, this is a Castlevania game after all. So it makes sense he would show up in the credits to sort of tease a scene. Equal. But then it is quickly revealed that this incarnation of Dracula is none other than Gabriel. <gasps> that, that's weird. Now, I personally love the idea that in this rebooted timeline, a Belmont would become Dracula. I think that's a fascinating way of handling things, and it really puts a different spin on the whole storyline in a way I like. But in order to make a twist like this work, they kind of need to sow the seeds a little better throughout the whole narrative. I like how it's presented though, and I think pushing it all the way into modern day is a really cool way of setting the stage for the sequel. It's also got the same vibes as the Kingdom Hearts 1 secret ending, so really, uh, this whole thing is in my favor. But um, there's something you should know about, about this whole thing too. This is the same ending as Dracula Untold. It's, it's pretty much the exact same ending. Go watch that movie. Don't have to, but it's it's the same ending. It even has Charles dance in a similar role at the end. It's insane. 
Why, why, why is it the same ending as this game? It, it's so strange. But I told you. I told you it'd come back around. Now I understand that the darker elements of Gabriel's character were there to plant those seeds that he may not be destined to be a 100% good guy. Again, we have those references to Gabriel being a Cronquist and having a darker personality. But the story also says that some of those darker traits were there because of Zobek brainwashing Gabriel with the devil mask. So none of that stuff really contributes as foreshadowing in the way it should. It doesn't really work with this particular twist. I think that in this rebooted timeline, making a Belmont Dracula while also being the start of the line of vampire killers is supremely genius because again, this is a gothic tale of tragedy. And how much more tragic can you get than becoming the villain of your own family for eons to come? It's a neat idea, but only if it is set up properly and emotionally. But Lords of Shadow treats this twist more like a, aha, bet you didn't see that coming sort of thing. One moment we see Gabriel in anguish at the end of his journey, then at some point later in his life we have to accept that he also became the series antagonist just by happenstance? If you're gonna make this the ending, I don't understand why it isn't actually part of the main storyline. Because for some reason, the answer for how all this happened in the first place is locked away in the game's two DLC episodes. I'm not gonna talk about these until the end of the video though. Never mind, let's just do it now. So the DLC is meant to bridge the gap between the ending and the post credit scene by explaining how Gabriel became a vampire and what his mindset was to turn him fully against God and the path of light. And it's insane that this is how the story had to be told, but uh, if this is how it had to be done, I'll be honest and say I like how it is done here. I like that at the end of the game we see Gabriel briefly filled with hope and this light to fight the darkness, and then when all of that is ripped away from him, we see him again in this DLC filled with sorrow and this loss of direction. And the cutscenes in this DLC are animated in this really cool art style that oozes with this gothic graphic novel style. Which is frankly how I wish most of this game's cutscenes were presented because it really does look cool. And it's also nice to see Gabriel and Laura interact a little more since I feel like their personalities complement each other really well. Laura is funny and Gabriel is depressed. It's a great combination. Laura asks Gabriel for help in dealing with a newly discovered threat and I think it's a nice way to reflect Gabriel's inner care for people for him to want to help her in the first place. But What's really the best part of the two DLC chapters is that they have intro narrations spoken by Gabriel. Looking back now, I realize that none of us has any real control over our fate. We are like leaves on the wind to be blown wherever we may. Which is just how the game should have done it in the first place. Robert Carlyle is able to give Gabriel some proper characterization here, and by giving him the floor to just fully describe his thoughts and feelings going in these closing chapters, I think it ends his arc in this game in a really neat way. Gabriel and Laura set out to defeat the Forgotten One, a construct created by an old enemy and imprisoned by the Brotherhood of Light a long time ago. And in order to reach its lair, Gabriel has to become a vampire, a creature of the dark. And to do that, he needs to drink all of Laura's blood, which kills her in the process. The final section of the DLC then gives us a Gabriel that is hell bent on killing one last foe before the end. I wanted blood. The demon would feel my wrath this night, would feel the bitter taste of defeat at my hand, and I would crush his soul to dust beneath my feet. He now understands his place in the world and decides that there's no place left for him in the light. It's the first time we ever see Gabriel speak with a concrete resolve. And when all is said and done, Gabriel destroys his combat cross and disappears without saying a word. It's a dark ending to his story for sure, and it's one I really do like. I think that bringing him this close to the light and redemption, and then ripping it all away at the last minute before taking him down the path of darkness is a really solid way to end his character arc for the game, and sets up for something new and interesting to come. And I also really like how the first half of the content is like a buddy cop adventure with Laura. Gabriel has someone to bounce off, doesn't have to deal with problems alone, and finds more in common with her life as a vampire than anyone else he meets in the main game story. But then he's finally left alone with nothing but grief, resentment towards everything, and nothing but one of the world's gravest threats to take his frustrations out on. Gameplay wise, the DLC offers up some of the best puzzles in the game. This puzzle 
where you need to get the guy into the center of the board but can only move one of the blocks to obstruct his path is very good. And the other one here where you need to push this block through the teleporters is very fun too. It's funny because this DLC is pretty light on the combat and focuses way more on puzzling and platforming. Which does have some neat ideas. Using the sprint boots to cross the water is smart and a fun new way of using them. Using the wall run to activate these dials is another fun idea, but this room with the spinning blades on the wall can go fuck itself. Oh, and the final boss of the DLC is dreadful. It's awful. The one time this game tries to do a boss with actual mechanics and patterns to learn that are semi-interesting, and it's a fight that does not complement any of the game's existing mechanics. Not that the bosses in this game are that great anyway. Boss fights usually fall into one of two camps. Big spectacle fights with less focus on the game's key mechanics and more so on clambering all over the boss in question and smacking glowing weak points on their body in a linear order. Or you'll be doing a standard boots on the ground action game boss that has a little sprinkling of that spectacle in the QTEs. These encounters are where every little problem I mentioned with the gameplay kind of comes into its own, with stiff climbing making these big titan boss fights a nightmare to get through. Sometimes you're smacking away at it, you'll need to move quickly out the way to avoid the titan coming in to swing at you, and sometimes Gabriel will not feel like moving in time. Or he'll refuse to jump up to a ledge for, for cover, causing you to get knocked off and having to climb back up to where you were. Thankfully the game lets you skip past some of those time sequences to make the process a tiny bit smoother. Now in situations like this with these big spectacle fights, I do not want to have to redo any of it at any time, because stuff like this is not supposed to be engaging gameplay wise. It's meant to make you stare in awe at the scale of it all. And honestly, there are some shots where I really was impressed, but when figuring out what the game wants from me is a mystery and making any mistake causes me to climb back up to the fucking thing, then the whole impact of the sequence is done. It's done. It's over. Just make these encounters nice looking QTEs with some ad fights in between. That's all I ask. Then it's fine. You can just do it and get it over with. Every other boss fight's about what you'd expect in the sense that you're a guy fighting other guys who are sometimes big and sometimes small and every now and then you'll fight something like a big bird. Most of these fights play out in the exact same way where you smack them a bunch, dodge some unblockable attacks and then maybe execute a QTE to finish them off. The cool boss fights are ones with multiple phases that throw out some cool extra thing you need to do. Like in Cornell's fight when he gets two different movesets, and in the last phase you have to destroy these pillars to finish him off while he chases after you. Most boss fights do not operate like that though, and instead just have you whip a thing until it's dead while sucking up some orbs from time to time to refill your magic meter. But Lords of Shadow tries to have some genuine creativity once in a while, and for that I have to commend it, even when it results in bosses like the final boss being really weird. Satan's fight is initially cool because you're fighting Satan, that's just a cool thing to do. But it quickly fell apart when I realized that dark magic was healing me, and that I wasn't dealing much damage to him when the magic I had on didn't oppose the color of his staff. Oh no. It's a traffic light fight. The final boss takes away the key components of the magic system and throws it in the bin to instead say, when he go blue, you go red. The Satan boss essentially takes every lesson you learn from the game about the magic mechanic and its balancing and tosses it out the window by making its key purposes null and void. It also does this infuriating thing where we have to run through various red and blue circles while switching between the magic at exactly the right time and yeah, I didn't like this. It was fine once I figured out the exact timing, but every time you mess it up, his health refills a little bit and you gotta do it again. It's just like, uh, it's just, it, it gets annoying. I am all for this level of creativity in a boss fight. I am not opposed to its concept but not for the final boss of the action game, which is where I'm supposed to put everything I've learned into practice for an ultimate showdown. And I also understand that narratively Gabriel is powered up at this point, but you can easily just MacGuffin that to mean that he's just powerful enough to take Satan on now, not powerful enough to spam magic forms and slap Satan into the ground. Which frankly is something that I don't love about Lords of Shadows overall vibe from a gameplay point of view. The one thing I don't think a Castlevania should be is a power fantasy, or at least not one that is unearned. And Lords of Shadow gives me intense vibes of a power fantasy, where Gabriel rocks up to any threat and knows he's going to win. Not that he wants to win, but that he knows he'll win. Not that this was intentional, mind you, it's ultimately a feeling that's left over from... 
God of War. Which is fine for God of War, because that is a power fantasy. Now what I ultimately mean here is that Castlevania usually gives off the vibe that you're fighting creatures of the night that are dangerous and able to kill you easily if you mess up, which adds a layer of satisfaction when you get over that barrier and fuck those enemies up anyway. <laughs> but learning those patterns, getting caught off guard by certain boss encounters and suppressing it all anyway is a feeling that is earned which Lords of Shadow doesn't really get across in the same way due to its pretty simple action gameplay and impersonal storytelling. Some action games sell the ideas of power fantasies really well, and having the gameplay be something you can learn and get exponentially better at can help to sell that power fantasy for the player as well. But Lords of Shadow isn't cohesive enough of an experience to sell those same feelings. It doesn't get across the tension that a Castlevania game should be able to communicate. And its action isn't quite competent enough for me to want to engage with it on a deeper level. These problems can probably be traced back to the game mostly copying the homework of other action adventure games instead of the inspiration that lies in its own series. As an action game, Lords of Shadow also feels weirdly ashamed that it is an action game sometimes, with the gamey elements like health bars, damage numbers, and experience earnings being things you can turn on in the extras menu. Not the options menu, the extras menu. As if to say that this stuff isn't part of the intended experience, right alongside Sword Snake's bandana, which Gearbill rocks pretty well, I have to say. But the spectacle mixed in with the power fantasy almost fundamentally changes what this game is compared to every other Castlevania game in existence. It muddles the tone of the experience, the relationship Gabriel has with the world, and ultimately makes certain story moments feel much weaker. Because when we get to the end of the game, yes, the journey is all about Gabriel eventually becoming Dracula, at which point a certain level of power fantasy would make sense. But before that point comes, there's crucial work that needs to be done to make his change into the series villain feel tragic cathartic and powerful. Instead, the twist is revealed and it doesn't honestly feel like it changes much, which feels crazy to say. Ultimately, I think Lords of Shadow's most tragic aspect is that it has a lot of really good ideas. It's just that it doesn't quite land every punch. Chicken. Now that we've come to the end of Lords of Shadow, I think it's a difficult experience to sum up. It's a game that shown me scenic views that I don't think I'll ever really forget and it's stuff that I've giddily told my friends about to the point that I've often gone back through my footage just to soak it all in again but the artistry of those moments is also held back by storytelling that is almost purposefully unfocused gameplay that is satisfying in some places where it counts but lacks the impact to stand above its lineage and characters that struggle to truly resonate with me when they really should because i absolutely adore lords of shadows vibe its story beats and overall deeply bleak readings on faith belief and betrayal not just the betrayal of others around you but the betrayal that we commit to ourselves when our resolve weakens when we let the darkness in and struggle to turn things around no matter what we learned on the journey along the way i also really like how lords of shadow tackles the nature of its villains and slowly unfolds folds how things aren't anywhere near as black and white as they seem. That creatures like vampires can be in pain too and are forced to live with their regret for an eternity, a fate that Gabriel now has to share. I love the tragedy that Gabriel spends his entire game working to be with his love once again, save the world and vanquish evil, only to be truly separated from her for all of time, nearly bring the world to ruin and become the very thing he swore to destroy. These twists are all fairly easy to see coming, sure, but the fact that Gabriel is so blind to his journey that he himself cannot see them coming just adds to those ideas of faith and belief. And to see the ending, where he once again has full belief in God and himself, only to get that torn away from him too is really good stuff. It's deliciously dark writing and arguably has some stuff that's some of the best writing in the series from what I've played, only let down by the fact that Patrick Stewart's character has the most lines in the game and that stoic attitude from Gabriel at all times doesn't let us inside his heart enough. The DLC thankfully does take things in a more introspective direction, which is what the whole game should have been. I love actually hearing Gabriel's thoughts and motives narrated by himself, and it makes his stoic nature in the actual missions feel well balanced. And these cutscenes? Damn 
damn, they look good. And as a reboot, I think Lords of Shadow handles the series with respect and strives to do something unique with it, with story beats that challenge the conventions of the franchise and set up for something truly interesting. Even with every misstep, I think Lords of Shadow is a commendable experiment that came out during a tumultuous time for certain franchises, particularly some of Konami's licenses that were starting to trend downwards and would have a lot of them be put on the shelf a handful of years later. Still, Lords of Shadow has good ideas. That's the most important thing to say. I think it just needed to step beyond what its contemporaries were doing and hone in on the satisfaction of combat just that little bit more. That and make some changes in storytelling presentation and it would have been a fantastic experience. And with how Mercury Steam ended things with the DLC, I have to be honest, I'm kind of excited for Lords of Shadow 2. Maybe they're going in a different direction with it and I'm all for a different direction after this game. But before we get there, we have to make one stop first. It's the DS game. We're doing the 3DS game. Next. Bye. Produced by...